Thanks. Well, we have the privilege this morning to continue our walk, our taking our time, slow walk along the Peter Parkway together. We're learning how suffering trains us that our God is good, to not waste our sorrows and not waste our tears, to learn how to look to the righteous judge and remember that our God has a plan and he's painting on a far greater canvas. We're learning about holiness, about our sanctification, growing in these things and applying these things of Christ to our daily application. And this morning, we're going to see how that touches marriage, holy husbands and holy wives. So would you please all be so kind to stand one last time and receive our teacher this morning, our dear and beloved brother, Sam Pittenberg. Thank you all. You can see. You can open up to 1 Peter 2 and 3. I've called this today, called to a blessing. Called to a blessing. The thrust of the section we're going to read today is to do what is good. To seek peace and pursue what is good among ourselves. To live in such a way of godliness that whatever my circumstance or station of life might be, I am blessed of the true God because I'm living righteously, doing the will of God. This is a long section in chapter two that bleeds into chapter three. And it includes the idea we looked at two weeks ago, that we're called to sufferings, like Christ was. And here in chapter 3, we'll also see that we are called to inherit a blessing. Peter is teaching us how to wear both, sufferings and blessing. And that even in sufferings, in entrusting ourselves to our faithful God, we are blessed of him. We are satisfied in him. We are content of heart. And this is the bigger picture of this overarching section. If you recall from last week what Sean shared, we looked at the end of chapter 2, how it talks about that Christ has suffered for you, leaving you an example that you would follow in his steps. He committed no sin. When he was reviled, he did not revile again. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly, the Father. And he himself bore our sins on the tree, on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And you were straying like sheep, but you have been returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. We're called to follow the Lord through, ble- through suffering into blessing in every season and every station of life. We're dead to sin. We're living for righteousness. And this is precious in God's sight. So as we look at this section, which is a very practical and application-filled section, remember that we are seeking to do good, and we have been called to inherit a blessing. When we do the good will of God in every station and through every season, we're blessed of the Heavenly Father. And this is going to apply specifically to husbands and to wives, and then briefly to all of us. In this section, too, you've had servants addressed, you've had uh, people living under the government addressed, you've had Christ addressed, and now a specific application for husbands and wives. One last thing. But I want to say, because this section is filled with talking about marriage, and of course not everyone here is married, our tendencies can be to, well, if it doesn't directly apply to me today, I'm going to just turn it off. And I would just encourage you that this is something to engage with well, because this sets the stage of the truth of the word of God for one of the most primary relationships on the face of the planet, the backbone of not only our Christian communities, but society in general, the marriage relationship. 
And so because you live in society and you live in the church, uh, you can have a healthy and biblical and blessed understanding of what godly marriage is and then be able to use that to help others, to love others, to support others. And to the married, of course, we'll see much that applies. But how important is the marriage relationship? When we're talking about living in the midst of a broken world, in the midst of unbelievers, in the midst of those that don't know God, how important is the marriage relationship? It's vital to the Christian community. It's vital to society in general. In fact, when God created the world, marriage is the first thing he instituted. That's how important it is. And marriage was designed by God for the common grace of mankind to enjoy. And marriage lived well by godly, biblical wives and godly, biblical husbands does something special in this broken, fallen world where everybody's lives are falling apart because of sin and self and worldliness. Biblical husbands, biblical wives, godly women, godly men, joined as one flesh in marriage, become a remarkable witness to the redemptive work of Christ. Even when we look at our marriages, we see them as part of what God is doing with his new creation when we live according to his good will. When our marriages are biblical, Christ-centered, joyful, they become signposts pointing to the goodness of God in Jesus Christ. And I think this is especially prevalent. This text was written three, uh, 2,000 years ago, essentially. It's especially prevalent now because do you know what's under attack in our culture? Out in the open, nice and plain to see? Families, marriages, biblical wifehood, biblical manhood. In fact, our culture actually views biblical marriage and the biblical roles of husbands and wives as wrong. Also, they say it will be unfulfilling that it's antiquated, and at worst, they say, it's actually oppressive. We want to be wise about these things. We don't want the cultural ethos to saturate our worldview. We, we receive our worldview from the truth itself. When we cling to the truth, it purifies us from the ungodliness of the world. And as uh, married couples, we become an indelible witness of the remark remarkable work of Jesus Christ. So let's read this here in 1 Peter chapter 3. And you'll see, if you're not familiar with this section, perhaps if the cultural ideas have saturated our worldview, you might twinge a little bit as you read what Peter says. Likewise, wives, verse 1, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And then the next verse we'll see is finally all of you. But let's take our time here in what Peter addresses. In verse 1 he says, likewise, wives. Likewise, wives. So in the same way it said servants, and then all of you, and how we're to live under certain arrangements in this world, likewise, there's something for wives. And this thing for wives will be just like it was for servants, just like it is for Christians living under the government, just like it was for Jesus the Messiah. It's going to subvert our cultural expectation. It's going to go against the grain of what we see is accepted in worldliness. Because we're called in to the witness of Christ. Remember, follow in his steps. Living righteously in every season and every station 
of life. And so now it addresses the wives. And in Roman culture, which these folks would have been in Roman culture, wives would typically adapt the religion and the worship of their husbands. So if a Christian woman was married to a pagan man, she would face quite an uphill climb. Peter is going to clearly focus this address of the wives also on those who have husbands who do not believe the word of the truth of the gospel. And he's going to support their decision to turn away from the cultural expectation and to follow Christ and then encourage them, but in their conduct, to win their husbands to Christ as well. And so this would have been, even if you're reading this and in your cultural context, you might go, well, I don't know, braiding hair. This would have been sort of revolutionary attitude for that culture, that Peter would address a woman as so effectual that she could turn the culture to win her husband from paganism to the true God. It's pretty powerful. In what way would she do this? Submission. Submission. Submission is to be subject to someone, to be willingly compliant to them, to reverently obey them. And this is what wives are to be toward their own husbands. Now, submission in our culture is a bad word. It's the exact opposite of the prevailing wisdom of our times, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A person who willingly submits is not a person who is considered wise or powerful. Our culture would rather have us self-seeking, self-assertive, and individualistic. But the problem with our cultural understanding of submission is that submission implies inferiority. That's not how the Bible uses the word subjection. Subjection does imply inferiority of personhood or value. In scripture, we see it means just the opposite. Because even Christ, it says, was subject to his own parents. And of course, he was subject to the will of the Father. Far from being a bad thing, like our culture would tell us, willful reverence and compliance with someone you're to be under is a good thing. It's a blessed thing to follow God's will in this world even if the world is telling us it's foolish. So it says, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Be willingly compliant, reverent to them. This is not a call, and this should be pretty clear, this is not a call for all women to be subject to all men. This is a call for you as a wife to be subject to your own husband. Not even somebody else's, right? Your own husband. And Peter here, he doesn't tell us why wives are supposed to be doing this. But the scripture does in all sorts of places, beginning from Genesis and all the way through the New Testament. Why does a wife submit to her husband? Because the husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. This is what Ephesians teaches us. And so the wives do well and are blessed of God to willingly respect, comply, and submit to the leadership role of a husband in the marriage. This is God's ordained order that the husband as the head of the wife would lovingly, thoughtfully, and in a godly manner lead his wife as the head of his wife. When marriages get turned around and these roles reverse, it actually doesn't bring blessing. This is God's ordained order. And sometimes we think of this and we go, well, does that mean because the wife submits, she's inferior? No. Of course, men and women are equal as human beings in the image of God, in his likeness. But they're not equivalent in their roles. We accept this in all sorts of areas. Are you and me equal? Yes. Are we equivalent in our roles in life? So when marriages get this twisted around, it becomes a deep hurt and pain 
and a poor witness of God's design and the redemptive work of Christ. And the beautiful part of a wife submitting to her husband in, in a healthy marriage, in a godly marriage, again, when you say, think submit, what are you thinking? Robotic obeying of commands? Is that what it looks like in a healthy marriage? No. A godly husband will lovingly lead his wife through discussion, through seeking her advice, her thoughts, coming to loving consensus within the marriage. So when it says, wives, submit to your husbands, our cultural view is what is making us think absolute submission to every single thing he ever says, like a robot would do. I become a voiceless, faceless doormat. That's the culture. That's not Christ. We need to be clear about that. However, in a wife submitting to her husband, she is coming up under him, supporting his leadership responsibility in the family. She's encouraging him that he should be accountable to Christ. And in his accountability to Christ, he would love her and lead her and serve her for her honor, for her good, and for her care. The purpose of this for the wives here, Peter mentions, so that they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So why are wives submitting to their husbands? So that even if their husbands are unbelievers, their beauty and conduct of heart wins their husbands over. So if you were a woman that became a follower of Christ and you're married to a pagan husband, are you supposed to just run away? Are you supposed to just get out of that marriage? No, that's not what he's asking for. He's saying, have the powerful effect that a Christian following Christ has, a conduct beyond blame that can turn even an unbelieving husband into a believer, can win him for Christ. It's the fact that the wife would be subject to her husband, showing her husband, even an unbeliever, honor and love and nourishment that she shares with him in a way that he doesn't deserve it, that that love wins him over. Doesn't that sound a lot like Christ with us, loving us when we didn't deserve it, caring for us, serving us when we were not serving him, and it wins us to him. So it is with a wife with an unbelieving husband. I won't say or pretend to say that this is easy in any way, and some of you women here have lived this or do live this. I don't think Peter's pretending to think that this is easy, but it's blessed. Because you're submitting yourself to God, despite your husband. Not unlike the servant who submits himself to God, mindful of God, despite maybe a harsh master. So with wives, although this isn't easy, and it's not God's design, God didn't arrange for a wife to have to bear that burden. He arranged for a wife to be nourished and cared for by a loving leadership of husband. But those that do this may win their husband. They might become the vessel by which he is won to Christ. Sometimes this happens even if they are not an unbeliever per se. They do believe in Jesus, but they don't live like they do. A marriage that isn't arranged around godliness. What is a wife to do? Start acting like a husband? No. Be even more of a godly wife. I will give a disclaimer for this, and this is across scripture as well. Just like we saw with the servants, or just like we see with the government, or any sort of thing where you might submit yourself to another, this is not to the point where that submission would cause you to sin against God. Of course, also, with a wife, it wouldn't be submitting yourself to hazard. That would be unwise. It would be wise for a woman to get help from hazard, not to submit to hazard. That's not at all what Peter has in mind, just to be clear. And so he talks about, okay, if a wife's going to do this, what does she do? Verse 3, do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of hair, the putting out of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. What, what a great couple verses. 
He's not prohibiting you braiding your hair or wearing jewelry, because also he says the clothing you wear. So if Peter was saying you can't braid your hair, you can't wear jewelry, he'd also have to say you can't wear clothes, right? That's, those thoughts are all together. His point is this. Don't let the outside be what shows your attractiveness. Don't let the outside be what shows your true beauty. If you're a woman and you want to have a more noble wifehood or a more noble womanhood than the debasedness we see in our society, let the adorning be not the outside only. Let the focus of the attention of what makes you a beautiful person be the inside, the imperishable beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit. A heart that knows God, trusts in God with quiet rest, and is following the Lord Jesus. It says that's very precious in the sight of God. Those qualities, gentleness and a quiet spirit, are considered weaknesses in our culture. Especially to women. They would rather have women be the opposite of that and self-assertive in those things. But God is calling us, and women in particular here, to quietness of heart, to gentleness of spirit. I love that it calls it an imperishable beauty. Did you know that physical beauty fades? Even the most beautiful woman in the world, I happen to know her. Her name's Desiree Pittenger. Is she up here? No? Shoot. Okay. She's with the kids. Everybody tell her I said that, just so I get. Even the most beautiful woman in the world, her beauty fades. I think we all know that. Uh, so beauty shouldn't be only skin deep. It should go beyond that, to the heart. So what is a woman adorning? What's the focus of her heart? Is it godliness, faithfulness, kindness? holiness, the love of the Father. What is it in the woman's heart? So if we're unmarried and we're thinking about marriage or some other thing, if we're thinking about marriage, look not on the outside alone. Look at the things of the imperishable beauty of the inside. And to the married, appreciate that what is most important about our spouse is is not the outside, but the imperishable beauty of a good and godly heart. Promote these things in our marriages. Recognize these things about one another. I always tell my girls, because they're so cute, you know how you always tell them, oh, you're so pretty, or you look so cute, or, and I always tell them, I say, what does dad love most about you? And they say, my beautiful heart. Thanks, Melissa. Dad points too. Tell, okay, dad and husband points today. But our culture gets that so backward. Isn't everybody looking for validation on only what you can see on the outside? A validation of appearance only. And then the quality of life is only skin deep. God is calling for a transformation of the inside. What has Peter been talking about since Peter chapter 1? Be holy. Is holiness a polished outside with a putrid inside? No, it's a beautiful inside, transformed by the word of truth that leads to an outside, an action that reflects godliness. So wives, adorn this. And then it gives an example of, of Sarah, Abraham's wife. This is how the holy women of old did it. It's pretty neat. Let's learn this lesson. Verse 5, it says, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, or in that culture, that could be more like Sir. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Oh, imitate the holy women of old. What were they like? They were reverent to their husbands. They were respectful of God's arranged meant for the marriage, God's authority in the marriage, in encouraging godly leadership from their husband. And she was doing so with trust toward God. Sarah went through some things, didn't she? She went from her home and wandered for years and years and years and was told she was going to have a baby. 
And that took 25 years. She went through some things. But her quiet trust in God was displayed in all those seasons and and stations of life. And it says, for this, if you do good, verse 6, and do not fear anything that is terrifying. The sense being that Christian women are not to let anything terrifying frighten them from their course of doing what is good in the sight of God. They will be blessed by God for this. So not every marriage is the same. Not every wife is in the same situation. But in submitting yourself to the will of God, you will be blessed of God in doing good. Now think of the culture of Rome and the pagan husbands that they may have been married to. What do you think the pagan wives thought of Christian wives? What do you think a pagan husband and their friends thought of Christian wives and the nobler wifehood that they had chosen? There's probably disdain there, rejection there, mocking there. And so it is today in our culture. Our culture is mocking what is good and godly marriage, biblical manhood, biblical husbandhood, biblical womanhood, and biblical wifehood. Don't be scared of them. Don't be terrified because they're the loudest voice in the room. Don't be scared because they have all the... uh, messaging in the culture. Quiet trust, faithful obedience to God produces in our hearts a peace that makes us unafraid of a world and a culture that is raging against what God has designed. Likewise, he's got something for the husbands. And again, your cultural ethos would go, well, why did he give like six verses to wives and one to husbands? In when he wrote this time period, the fact that he's talking that much to wives would have been somewhat revolutionary because they were just supposed to do whatever the husbands did. So the fact that he gives six verses to wives and one to husbands is kind of flipping their whole culture on its head anyway. Now look what he says to husbands because this is pretty intense too. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers are not hindered. That's how he ends it. So that your prayers are not hindered. So what does he ask the husbands to do? Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. This is literally live with them according to knowledge. This is in the sense of, of course, knowing what is good and godly, knowing the word of truth applying that in your marriage, knowing the biblical role of husbands, the biblical role and value of wives, and then applying that in your marriage. But also in the sense of understanding the life of your wife, the heart and the needs and the interest of your wife. I think any husband here knows that whatever your wife is like, my wife is different. There's some similarities, but they have their own, of course, Um, wonderful, individualistic things as well. And so husbands learn to live in an understanding way with their wives. Doing this, showing them honor, extolling their value, showing them their worth by our actions, by our words, by our thoughts toward them, honoring who they are as our wife. And it says in these two ways, show her honor as the weaker vessel and as an heir together of life. And so you might go again, you heard the word weaker. Well, women aren't weaker. You know, it starts creeping in there. He's not calling women inferior. He just said weaker vessel that's an heir together of the grace of life. But by calling us heirs together, there's that equality together in Christ, right? But he says to husbands, honor her as the weaker vessel. And this is in the sense of showing her active respect, active attention, active care that results that she knows the worth of her vessel, the worth of her person. And a lot of times when the scripture actually speaks of how we treat what's called the weaker, God draws attention and calls it weaker because God gives more honor to the parts which lack. Isn't that something? 
God is for the oppressed and the widow and the orphan and the part which lacks. And so he draws attention to it so that those who are in a position of authority or strength or power in relative terms would do so for the good of those who are weaker. So it is here with the wife. She is deserving of the considered honor in light of her intrinsic female worth to her husband. Even the word here for woman is not the usual word for woman. It's the word for feminine. Or it could be translated the female one. The idea is drawing the sense of the difference between a man and a woman. But that that femaleness of his wife should bring an intrinsic worth to the husband. She's something special to him. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, which he does not have without her. She brings a completeness to him. Isn't that beautiful? And so give honor to her as the weaker vessel. And there's plenty of things to consider here. But I think it's clear that there are basic differences between men and women physically. Both in terms of sex, gender, but also in terms of proclivities physically. Generally, men are stronger than their wives, generally. Um, Also, you see contextually... The wife is submitting to her husband. The husband is the one with the headship or the authority role, the leadership role. And so the wife is, in a sense, in a weaker position. She's not in charge. So what should a husband do? Should he, therefore, make use of his authority in an oppressive or in an ill manner toward her? Or should he use his authority, like Christ does, for the good of those who are under him? He should use it that way. Well, how does he do that? By honoring her as the weaker vessel. In a a practical way, I kind of like to think of it this way. It's the difference between, say, like a delicate vase and a concrete block. What would you do with something so delicate? How would you handle it? How would you honor it? Are you going to take it like a concrete block and just throw it around? No. You're going to treat it delicately with honor, with respect to its worth and its delicateness. So the husband is using his role from God as head of his wife for her honor, for her care, not self-serving, but exercising his authority for sacrificial service. That's upside down in our culture as well. And he tells them what to do here, and this is pretty remarkable, and husbands should listen up on this. It says at the end of verse 7, so that your prayers are not hindered. And this would go against the grain of even what we think in the Bible. We thought God always hears us, right? His ears are open. There's plenty of verses like that. And then all of a sudden, Peter says, so that your prayers aren't hindered. Well, the concept here is if you were to trample underfoot the daughter of God, God is not well pleased with this. And God, as the father, that's his daughter, corrects these Husbands that would misuse their authority or through egotism or selfishness lead astray their wives, the father would correct them. They won't get the kind of answers to prayer that they think they're going to get. Uh, th- there's a chapter in Malachi, chapter 2 in the Old Testament, where the uh, men of Judea were taking younger pagan women. They were divorcing their Jewish wives that they married when they were young because they were getting, you know, beauties fading, that kind of thing, right? And they trade them in for a pagan younger woman and then they were going to the altar and they're putting tears upon what it says God's altar and God says I'm not going to hear you because you have trampled underfoot essentially what I love it's not something so husbands can't go abroad and act spiritual and then go home and be the opposite the idea for the husband is let it be real holiness godliness in every category of life, and then especially, first and foremost, in your marriage. I think in our culture, and sometimes just in the busyness of life, it's the marriage that gets last or second best. And in God's view, cultivating a godly, unrushed, unhurried relationship for the honor and care of your wife is a precious and valuable thing. You serve God well when you serve your wife well. Finally, all of you, 
This is how you know Peter's a really good preacher. He says, finally. And then he's going to write the rest of chapter 3, the rest of chapter 4, <laughs> and the rest of chapter 5. That's how you know. So in closing, I'd like to say this for the next 30 minutes now. Finally, all of you have a unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Again, think of that in light of our culture and what is promoted. Does this describe us? Does this describe us individually? Does this describe us in our marriages? Does this describe us in our church? Does this describe us across all relationships? These things are to be shown across the board in every relationship. We're living out through human relationships, marriage included, but all relationships are following of Jesus Christ as our Lord. In every sphere of life, in every station of life, in every season of life, we're showing Christ's lordship in our relationships toward others, in our humility of mind, not our self-assertiveness, in our unity of spirit on the truth of our tender hearts, of our brotherly love. It tells us in verse 9, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, and here's our title, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. This has all of us in mind. How are we supposed to be? Don't repay evil for evil. What do we read about in chapter 2? That's what Jesus did, right? Or reviling with reviling. What did we read in chapter 2? How did Jesus do it? He didn't revile. On the contrary, even greater. It's not just bite your tongue. It says, bless. So those that would do evil to you, you do good to them. You overcome evil by doing what is good. Just like Jesus did. Overcoming the evil of man in his crucifixion by doing the ultimate good of his sacrificial death for their sins, the very people who were crucifying him. In our culture, we think that repaying evil for evil will bring us some sort of satisfaction. Or giving it back to somebody who just gave it to us will bring us some sort of vindication. But there's blessedness in overcoming. Because repaying evil for evil, reviling for reviling, actually only creates within us a bitter spirit. And a bitter spirit brings destruction to our lives. You want to be free from what the world can do to you? Live above it by doing what is good. Living godly will bring blessing to us, even in the midst of dark world and difficult trials. And I love this here. It says, for you have been called to inherit a blessing. <laughs> and this should be a wonderful reminder for us. Because in chapter 2 it said, you've been called into sufferings like Christ. But we wear both. Yes, into sufferings. But why? Because ultimately, we inherit a blessing. It's not our griefs right now that are the best picture of what Christianity is. It's our joy. It's our hope, because what is coming, the blessing of this life with God now into eternity will far outweigh forever, whatever my season and station is today. So we have been called to inherit a blessing. So we can be girded up in strength of our faith through sufferings and through the blessings of God. Peter wraps this all up by quoting Psalm 34. He says, hey, you know, the Old Testament says this too. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deception. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eye of the Lord is on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Does God want us to have good days and love life? Yes. How? It's really clear. And faithfulness to him, mindful of him, 
believing in his ways and following in Christ's footsteps through all times, all seasons, and all stations. And he also reminds us, God will judge the unjust. God will be against the evildoer. Righteousness is going to win, and it's winning now. But we can know in the meantime, whether you're a servant, or you're an, under an unjust government, or you're a wife with a husband that does not believe, whatever your situation, station, or season, Psalm 34 reminds us that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. He sees, he knows, and it says his ears are open to their call. God sees us, hears us, he'll, invent, he'll avenge evil, but he's giving us the empowerment now to do what is good, what is righteous, in the face of a dark world so that we can entrust our souls to our faithful creator while doing good. And we prove this out. There's no way to prove this in your own life but to experience it. Experience the blessing of choosing God's way over the culture. Experience the blessing of following Christ's pattern instead of self-assertiveness. Experience the blessing of what it means to be known and led of God. The quietness of rest it brings to the soul. The love of life that it brings to the soul. Knowing that not right now, but what is coming is going to be even greater. So that's our encouragement here from Peter for this week. And anything to do or close in some prayer here? We'll close in a brief prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are so good to us. Help us and teach us in your way. Make us more like our Lord. Renew your word within our hearts that we can walk in your truth. I pray today for each person here, whatever it might be that we're in or out of, Father, that we can entrust our souls to you. You're our faithful God. You are with us. We are thankful that you see. We are thankful that you hear. We are thankful that you act on our behalf as our good God through Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.